<laughs> so I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, you're, you're fine. I was, I was just helping out. I was just helping out a fellow inside salesperson. Yeah. He's, He's a big boy. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to welcome you this afternoon and, and thank you. I've enjoyed speaking with several of you and understand a little bit of what you're looking to get out of this session this afternoon. But this session, I would, again, just want to thank you for coming on behalf of uh, Thomas Haymore and myself. Thomas is from the Predictive Cloud team, and I'll be speaking to the Predictive Cloud and the value that it brings to you know, bridging, if you will, the digital channel or the commerce e-commerce channel with sales. <coughs> My name is Eric Murata. I lead product marketing for Cloud Craze. We are a B2B e-commerce platform built natively on Salesforce. Uh, much of the perspective I'm going to share with you today is really driven from my experience from building and managing uh, CPQ solutions, predictive analytics solutions, and e-commerce solutions in the past, as well as being a sales rep. Um, you know, it really just informs you and pulls together the great opportunity that we have within the technology space to really digitize and transform how we engage with our customers. And part of that engagement with our customers, working with um, communications companies, telcos, right? software companies, high-tech firms, life sciences. Working with all these different firms, they're asking, especially now at CloudCraze, they're asking us, how can we, you know, we're using Salesforce, you're native on Salesforce, how can we go to market and be more effective in our engagement? Well, this is where the partnership with the Predictive Cloud team and inside sales come to play. But I first want to take you on a little bit of a journey and really help identify what customer engagement means and I'm going to do that with my friend Jeremy Piven here. Um, I'd like to have shown my grandmother in the 40s and 50s shopping at Hallie's department store in Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, but the idea is this. You know, you, she walked into that store, the sales rep knew Angie Murata. They knew why she was in there. They knew the birthdays, the anniversaries she shopped for. They knew the things that she typically liked to buy. That sales rep also knew their products intimately and could provide a really rich contextual shopping experience and blend his knowledge of Angie with his product knowledge. B2B enterprises, they used to sell like that too, right? But then this happened, <laughs> right? <laughs> we started to digitize the commerce process, faxing order forms back and forth. And it was great, right? You could you know, communicate instantaneously. Everything was written down and it was very clear what was ordered, right? Then, of course, the marketing team and the sales management started getting involved. <laughs> it's just a uh, this, is, this is the whole notion of the uh, supercharged hyperbole really yeah. playing out here. Um, but they would start getting involved, like, oh, we should push, let's fax out the weekly promotion, the monthly 20, offer. 20,000 faxes per second. Right. So <laughs> you start Monday morning, you just inundated with all this information. Well, guess what then happened? <laughs> right? The whole data order entry, which via a swivel chair, blew up. We were, the customer was dissatisfied. They were getting the wrong items ordered at the wrong quantity. They had oftentimes the wrong price, whether it was the sales rep was selling a stale price or didn't input it correctly on the right contract. Then there was faxing back and forth with the enterprise on the customer support and service. Finally, their escalations to AR. Horrible, horrible, horrible experience. Then, of course, was born the CRM and Salesforce automation to save the day. Right? That's what happened, right? Well, End of the story. Not quite. Here's what is happening today. Today, uh, in fact, this stat came from a bridge group survey last year on the SaaS market. On average, there's a 34% churn of sales reps. That's the average. 10% of those organizations are 55% and higher. Remarkable, right? So you are now spending five, six months, again, through their stats, um, onboarding the customer to just your products, just your product information. Well, what about your customer data and the account information? Well, though that's driven by the annual account shuffle. <laughs> Many organizations is biannual, at least, right? Um, that has a dramatic impact on sales and sales performance. In fact, the same bridge group's research um, identified that over the last four years, 
there's been a 7% decline in quota attainment. <laughs> now throw that in with changing business models within the organization, new product introductions, partnerships that are developing every day, um, which introduce yet another set of products and another set of services, and of course, changing prices. Every day, every month, product marketing, product management's changing the price, this is what we're gonna sell now, this is how we're gonna sell it. Um, that's having a dramatic impact on the sales organization. And for customers, we're now in the age of the customer, right? Now, <laughs> customers have been driving our businesses. They've been driving these biz business model disruptions for years, right? Call it the B2B uh, or the, the consumerization of B2B commerce or the Amazon effect. Every organization is trying to adapt new business models, adapt to the customer and their needs because frankly, we are in the driver's seat as consumers today. You know that as sales reps, as service reps, you know that you're responding to the market dynamics on every given day, in any given day. Well, the Forcer Research has also really has identified um, last year uh, a trend, a macro trend that's occurring. And it's a paper that they put out called The Death of a B2B Salesman. I encourage everybody to go out and read it. In fact, if you Google it, you can find a fantastic infographic on this. But I'm gonna speak to it a little bit. The point is, at, 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 of the paper, is the digital experience, the commerce experience, is driving business today. $15 trillion, uh, by some estimates, will be impacted by digital channel. This is a channel shift from sales to businesses. And you know this. You know this in your own lives. You want to interact with the, the digital channel wherever you are, on your commute. You're logging into your mobile device, to a customer site, to Amazon, whatever, a retailer, fam a fantastic retailer like um, uh, Selfridges, um, and to engage with them. Well, your customers, guess what, are doing the same thing. Before they call you in this research, they are doing the, their research, uh, deciding what they wanna buy online, whether it's through your site or a competitor site. But the point is, the digital channel has tremendous impact and value to the sales organization, but it also comes at a cost. 20% of the sales reps in North America will <coughs> lose their jobs, or one million, to this digital channel shift. So this is a remarkable macro trend that I wanna first set in place before we talk about you know, the hope, next best hope, or what's the um, Star Wars? Ah, anyway, a new, new hope. hope. There it is. Right, so this is, I was a little worried the way the room was set up that I might get beaten up with all that preamble. Uh, especially you know, working with and looking on, upon you as sales reps and sales managers. But there is a, a, a new hope here. There is real opportunity. And this is what we are coming to market with together with Inside Sales and the Predictive Cloud. Now, when you look at the customer journey and the customer life cycle, this is really, and Joe, you're talking about it too with your business, um, this is really where uh, the digital channel and the customer life cycle the digital channel is the customer channel, right? This is where all the business units come together. Your marketing, sales, service, product management, merchandisers, uh, service organizations, the data scientists, the focus on retention and, and advocacy. Who we are bringing in with marketing and a lot of your marketing analytics, driving people, foot traffic into the site. The, mar the marketers and merchandisers are developing the rich product catalogs to inform the customers so that they can then reach out to the sales rep, say, this is what my interests are, right? All of this is digitized. And what we're focused on providing is that omni-channel experience here within commerce to not only take this basket of goods, these products and services that you've expressed interest in, but also deliver that and allow the customer to order them, but also sales and service to order on behalf of that customer. This is something unique that we do at CloudGraze that the market really doesn't do. Uh, also, we serve them. They can look at their orders. They can look at their order history, pay the invoices online. Um, they can manage returns right through here. Customer lifecycle. This is what we touch. This is what we organize around, and this is the macro investment um, taking place in the marketplace. So what are we doing with um, this information, this data, this customer lifecycle? Well, from a predictive cloud perspective, uh, there's three use cases that we're gonna talk to briefly. 
um, and then I'm going to hand it over to Thomas. Uh, the first one really does uh, maximize and take advantage of a lot of inside sales work around lead nurturing, right? What they've done is identify when the best time to call Joe is um, or engage with Joe in an email that he's going to open up and consume. We're taking those same sort of use cases and flipping it to the sales process to identify where in time and how is best to engage that customer to buy, to transact. And again, the idea is to drive sales. Second area of investment is intelligent recommendations. This goes beyond the, the Amazon people who bought X, also bought Y. What we're doing is driving machine learning to actually provide uh, really a tool for sales enablement. We talked about that five month ramp for sale, to enable sales to, to understand your products and try to sell them. We can do that with machine learning in, in an instant because what we're doing is taking your 10,000 SKUs, 5,000 SKUs, 100 SKUs, whatever it is, uh, and configuring a basket of goods that speak specifically to you. And so that sales rep doesn't have to go through a long, arduous cycle um, of enablement the system and the tools are providing them with greater opportunities to succeed and achieve um, quota relief. Pierre? Yes. I think an example might be helpful. So what we're talking about here, we have customers like Coca-Cola, maybe Embev, and Hallmark, and Adidas Reebok. So in the case of Adidas, they, are, they had reps going out to visit their smaller retailers and literally saying, here's the new season's setup. How many do you want? With this kind of recommendation, we can say, okay, based on a profile, based on data, we're able to say you should stock these styles in these sizes in this color preference. With Hallmark, uh, they're actually doing this sort of with a, a super spreadsheet where they're actually taking a look at how many greeting cards of which type should you get for uh, Valentine's. And then they're able to show a retailer, well, you know, you, know, you were a little cheap, you only gave us six feet instead of 12 feet. And you only order 10 instead of 20, and look, look at the money you left on the table because someone in the same situation ordered more and listened to our recommendation. Here's the money you can make. You gave us this extra six feet. That's really what we're talking about. Is, um, and that normally would be in a really good sales rep's head. But these customers are typically too small to warrant that. Who's, who's the buyer of your product? Who's the retail customers? What group are targeting? Well, the retailers aren't buying the products, the brands are buying our solution to better serve so make the their customers or distributors. In some cases, it's two tiers down. So they go through distribution and then they have the actual so The sales people will bring vendors. The sales departments will bring vendors. Usually it's a collaboration. So it's typically either owned by IT, the VP of Commerce, or digital. Um, sometimes it is also, in a lot of B2B organizations, it is a CRO's charter um, to make this investment as part of a team in collaboration with IT and the owner of VP of uh, Commerce. So that's really where that, that product life cycle, that journey I, I showed, it really does pull together uh, a cross-functional team within the organization to make that investment. Yeah, and on the, uh, on the nudge orders, like a, if you take a look at a typical brand like Coke, they have three people visiting every retail outlet in North America. They've got the retail merchandiser, they've got the delivery driver, and they've got an order team. So they're, and they have 350,000 outlets. So they got, they want to get rid of that order taker, it's not adding value. That retail execution as they can. Um, and empower the driver to make uh, order change decisions on the truck as they deliver. And then with analytics, we can say, okay, you place this order on Tuesday, we're delivering it on Thursday. If something's changed between then, the weather's changed, for example, we think you should bump that order up by now. And we can do that in conjunction with the sales channel or, or intervene with the call center channel based on the data that we're seeing. So all channels are in sync. It's not an either or, which is how traditionally um, direct sales teams have felt threatened by e-commerce channels. So in this case, it's the, the term we use is money wise sleep. They're not wasting time taking orders. They can see every order that's in Salesforce. They can intervene in orders and they can handle exceptions. But even for, for life sciences, these types of use cases um, really abound. Um, and the third area, because uh, I do want to be mindful of time, I mean, it, we do have a 90-minute gap between, 
before we all start screaming free bird. But. Yeah. <laughs> 90 minutes, right? Let's do this. <laughs> no hesitation. Um, <laughs> so, uh, but there, there are a lot of opportunities in life sciences as well for this, <clears throat> especially as you work to communicate directly with your customers um, who, may, who may need to buy refill, to refill certain things, um, like in a diabetic space, for example. Mm. The other aspect that we're looking at is the customer analytics, right? How do I, now that I've captured this, I've shaped some behavior, I've driven revenue, I've driven an a, a experience that really is superior because it takes into account the service, the sales and service teams. Also my needs as a consumer to buy directly. So now I'm measuring the, the interaction. I'm measuring and scoring the customer on their lifetime value, on their likelihood to attrit, on their propensity to buy or recommend that uh, retention and advocacy. This is what we're driving uh, back into the process so we can inform sales, inform that driver uh, to engage with the customer on a more, maybe a more personal basis on an issue that they had with their previous order, on that, um, that invoice challenge uh, that needs to be resolved. So these are uh, different use cases that we are looking to drive here. Oop, that's backward. Why does a digital channel matter so much? Because it's digital. Uh, effectively, it's digital. We can capture and measure everything. We're able to capture the site that you were on previously so that I know you came from, um, I was gonna, I was gonna maybe give an inappropriate example. Uh, you came from Microsoft <laughs> and now you're visiting the Salesforce site, right? Um, so we can capture that information. We can capture the effectiveness of the campaign. What is working? What has inspired the customer? What specifically are their express interests via search, via product detail pages? What are they exploring and adding to wish lists? What have they abandoned in carts? We take all this information, put it in through the machine learning process to inform a next best action, right? What is the propensity for them to buy that basket of goods? Um, when should we call? What products should we close on? Andrew mentioned the, the weather impact. So for in the conversations we're having with Coca-Cola and ABM Bev, weather, holidays, weekends, end of the month, um, ending on a Saturday versus on a Tuesday, all this information comes into play to drive a sales process, to drive a sales outcome and goal. And that's what we're doing here uh, with our friends at Inside Sales and the Predictive Cloud. So with that, I'm gonna Perfect. hand it over to to Thomas to talk. Okay. First, um, I hope this is on, but you guys can all hear me because there's like three of us here. Um, okay, so I wanted to go back to this first. And uh, oh. when you guys were listening to these use cases for, for Cloud Craze, what were some of the thoughts you had? Obviously, you don't count because you know these really well. So really, I'm looking at a really small number of people here. You're going to have to answer my questions because I'm staring right at you. Well, when you start talking about like, you know, your sales predictability as far as like, what you guys are going to send out, is it like based off of RFID or just like SKUs that you guys have tied into your... To your um... Well, they do, we do, they do cycle counts. So the theory is they do okay. cycle counts occasionally just to understand what the retail execution is. So they have a sort of, it's not like VMI, they sort right. of know what the stock should be. They can see what the, um, what the order flow is and what the order flow should be. For that area, and so that's really so based off of like annual or past, uh, or past buying, buying yeah. trends, uh, okay. peer group buying trends. It's also look at uh, we look at uh, regional buying trends. So it's a mashup of all of this information. Um, that so it's we, not necessarily contingent on the actual uh, um, retailer. Yeah, uh, that correct. Okay. But it could all it could all be integrated, right? And, uh, well, the thing I love about this discussion, discussion happening right now is that we're, we're going up and down a level that we may not realize. We're going from general applicability down deep into like the nuts and bolts of cloud craze and a lot of examples with your, the beverage and the consumer products, right? The great thing about that is that's what predictive cloud is all about, is that what we need is we need specific use cases that drive tons of value in specialized contexts. Now, CloudGrid is a platform that can span a ton of things, but in, these, in some of these examples, you have a lot more depth with, say, you know, Coca-Cola, right, than another, right? 
together with something like Predictive Cloud that can provide the general insights and mechanisms they need. And one of the great things about, when we say predictive analytics, and you were at my previous session, I'm just gonna repeat myself. When we say predictive analytics, like we mean something specific that's not just stats. And Rob is probably gonna correct me because I'll get some of this wrong, but you know, the statistical methods for predicting outcomes and coefficients have been around a long time. Like, you know, anyone that can do a logistic regression can be like, well, there's the coefficient. You move variable X by 1% and you get this much change or whatever, however you set it up. That is predictive, but that's not actually what we mean by predictive analytics. What we mean is that you have a source of data from which with specified algorithms you can extract insights and then, and this is probably the most valuable part, deliver that insight as an action or prescription. Because if you don't deliver the insight as an action or prescription, if you don't deliver it as a nudge, or if you don't deliver it as a, hey, we've, we've identified a segment that has these particular patterns and needs, so do X, all you really are is kind of a fancy BI team. Nothing wrong with that, but that's a different value. BI tends to be retrospective, and it tends to be for insights to discuss, to review as a committee, and tends to be focused also on human decision making. Let's talk about strategy, let's talk about you know, what our go-to-market strategy is, for instance. Predictive analytics needs to be about what do you do now? And in this context with Cloud Craze, it's how do I deliver more value to my distributors? How do my distributors give more value to the retailers? Um, and part of it is, that, again, back to the human and machine judgment is, you know, deciding what products to offer, right? Deciding to do new Coke as opposed to yeah. old Coke, right? Yeah. Now, could machine learning have solved that? We, our, the example from the previous session was Napoleon's March on Moscow. In this session, it's uh, new Coke versus old Coke. Could machine learning have told you not to launch new Coke? Actually, probably yes, because um, it wasn't that difficult to figure out. But that isn't a machine learning question, right? That is a strategic human judgment that will be backed up by tons of analysis, right? Now, when it comes to predictive, analyzing weather, pa weather patterns and deciding who to offer what based on that is like, is that a human judgment? There's probably some human judgment in there, you know, maybe about this product we think will be very attractive to uh, millennials, may, you know, curse them. Um, and, but we don't have the data yet, so it is just a human judgment, and we'll have the data next year, right? Okay, that's a great human judgment. Airbnb, do you guys remember how they got their start? Extreme scarcity of housing during, I believe the DNC, if I'm not mistaken, the Democratic National Convention in, oh, that was Obama won, right? So you know, the world was upended and people were losing their minds and it was great, right? Could Airbnb have predicted that? Actually, yeah, everyone knew it was gonna happen, but now they can predict it over and over and over again. Where's the paucity of housing gonna be and to act on that? Okay, so um, I, that graphic kind of went in reverse order there. There we go. Okay, so what is predictive cloud? I'll give you a little bit of insight, although I think I kind of just gave you the use cases for it. So predictive cloud is, uh, it's a very ambitious attempt by us to provide value, like I said, with the tools people need to get these predictive insights into their companies, into their applications, when cloud craze is an excellent example of an extremely sophisticated application and plat, uh, set of applications on a platform that delivers tremendous value and predictive can add more. We look at a customer life cycle kind of in these categories, all the way from marketing, all the way to the, well, the life and death, the life and death of a customer, how a customer becomes a customer and then becomes not a customer. Um, and we think of these key pillars as ways we can add predictive insights and add value to our customers. Cloud Craze probably spans nearly all of these at the moment, uh, probably heavier toward the customer and customer success end than toward the generation and acquisition end. But we see Predictive Cloud as adding value in all of these, obviously digital channels being superior for us because of the data. And you'll notice that we've chosen not just marketing or um, sales development and sales, but specific applications that are cutting edge and they're partially only possible because of the data that's available. Account-based marketing, Avanish can speak a lot on account-based marketing, but account-based marketing in a digital world is only possible because of the huge density of data that is now available so you can track a lead back to the account and then combine it all together. 
you know, dynamic sales forecasting is similar. Without a system like HD forecasting or others or a CRM, you can't, just don't have the data points to really pr make it, well, to predictify it, if you will. Um, so, so why, again, why does Predictive Cloud add value to a partner like Cloud Craze? And I think this is part of the reason why. If you're in my previous session, again, I talked about predictive science. I also talked about data. I have access to open source statistical tools, just like Rob, just like, just like Matt, um, when he's not running 100 miles a week, um, like anybody else. But what I don't have is this, and this, and this, and all the other data sources that every company has in abundance, plus the data source a partner like uh, platforms like us have just from our accumulated sets of partners and clients. It's the combination of the predictive science, and it takes a lot of expertise to go from sort of helpful to very helpful, and the data. But these data, are, are, these, are, these, are, these, are, these, are, these are like millennials, they're poorly behaved. Like millennials, they have very specific demands, and they're inflexible in how they'll work. They'll only come to work for free lunch. Sorry, I'm just I'm getting a little ahead of myself. Um, so like millennials, this data have great potential, but can be poor colleagues. So you need a system, you need a system that can pull, that can pull all the different data into an engine and not care. And the great thing about predictive analytics, especially the way we've built it, and Rob, again, can give you more details on how this happens, is we don't care. Like, we don't care as long as we can access the data. We don't care that it might say Fred or Frederick. We don't care that it might be an integer here and a continuous variable here. We can handle that. It sounds stupid, but it's so hard. And you guys probably... All of you here that are, especially not millennials, have dealt with CSV files and trying to transfer one stupid set of data from one database to the other, and then someone spells Frederick with a CK, someone else spells it with a C, and you're screwed. Like you're never, they're never gonna get merged. That's part of the value we provide, because again, you are sitting on a treasure trove of data and you simply can do nothing with it. We were working with a client a few months ago and we couldn't answer the simple question of where do you record the first purchase this client made? The first purchase. Because if you know the first purchase, then you can have an algorithm for net new customers and then an algorithm for expansion, right? Subtle difference, but it's important, again, to have this streamlined flow. We didn't know. We couldn't answer it. It might be in an Oracle CRM somewhere. We just don't know. And... That's why he needs this. It's in a fax machine that the CEO gets emailed, and that gets printed out. Um, okay. So they can even tell like through their accounting software or anything. No. There was a VP of predictive analytics, and then a VP of BI, and then like a VP of you know, and it was like it is there. It's definitely there. But and again, like, why would you create a system that correlates all of that if your sales organization is running? Only if you have a use case for predictive value, right? There are many different buyers yes. buying from many different parts of the business and many different, you know, ver you know, different channels of sales. So that problem is, how do I know, how do I identify these different buyers across these different systems and pull that together? Just to kind of yeah. speak more to it, that's really what's going on here. It's this, it's this big inference engine that's looking at all these data points, and it's one of its most fundamental values is to identify and and orient or correlate, you know, activities and behaviors. And yes. So flushing that. So like I said, yeah. if you're a small organization selling to one type of buyer, maybe that's not as tough. The big enterprise, very, very tough. Right. So Rob, we, we saw that too because we started seeing very significant ROI benefits for our larger customers that they couldn't, we couldn't answer the question, which levers to pull more on, where to make the investment. Just, they were happier, they were buying more, and the mix was better. But we, we didn't know how to get more granular and push in one area and invest in another area because there was no there was no model. It was just three different channels, the sales rep call center and the online channel kind of each going their own way and the results were, were better than they would have been in the past, but not not really 
Yeah. Well, and that's back to the point earlier of when we say predictive organization or predictive analytics, what do we mean, right? We mean more, again, than just the science behind it, although you do need, you know, your posse of PhDs to kind of, you know, come up with that as well. But we're talking, you know, Dave talked a little bit about the scientific method, but the great thing about having an integrated predictive analytics system is that you typically don't get there unless you have this system set up. So as soon as something like our Neuralytics, which we use for our sales acceleration platform, which also works with Predictive Cloud, as soon as that's integrated, it's making recommendations, which are prescribed to reps. Reps are operating on that, or they could be sales reps, customer service reps, whatever they are. And then those, those uh, results are captured. And so you've just closed the loop, and now you have a self-learning system. You have a system that doesn't, again, it doesn't have human biases, which is great. Now, it does need human strategic thinking. It does need to have someone put their thumb on the scale sometimes. But the great thing about this is that, again, the example from last session, if the CEO's favorite marketing campaign is just the most horrifically performing campaign, you know, at the very end of the sales cycle, traditionally, it's actually very hard to figure out. It's very easy for the CEO to be like, I just really like this campaign. I just, I, just, I, just, I just love it, you know? And then you run Neuralytics or Predictive Cloud on it, it pulls out of the CRM, and it's like, close rate, 0. 000, just negative, you know? And it's like, that's hard. You can't avoid that. And the nice thing is about this system, the system doesn't then say, we're going to keep pushing that because the CEO loves it. Doesn't care. It automatically just kind of gets booted out of the mix, and you're automatically prioritizing different things. It also helps because it can... In terms of the human factor, it depersonalizes a little bit. Everyone's getting slapped around by the algorithm, right? And so people can make better decisions and move on. Anyway, I want to hand it back to Eric, and I'll skip through our, uh, our personnel slide with some of, the, some of the fancy faces we have. We, some of them are here, and we can talk to you about them later. But it's just a collection of really brilliant business people and data people. That's all you need to know. And um, yes, I'm one of them, just in case you wanted to know. Um, um, yeah, absolutely. Sorry, I thought it was. Um, yeah, Dave Healy, obviously the, like I wouldn't call him a millennial, um, but he's definitely a hipster. Um, I mean, look at that. That's that's a snappy dresser. Um, anyway, just to sum up, again, what we're looking for is a way to make an organization predictive, which means marrying the science with the data with an application. The nice thing about cloud craze is the level of sophistication is a little bit intimidating, you know, because it's a, it's a big project. But it kind of marries the, the two platforms together. A, a, a platform that has an immense ability to deliver these insights directly into the flow of a company with a platform that has the ability to take all those different data sources and ingest them and make something out of them. Great. Thank you. And so just for a quick advertisement on cloud craze <laughs> before you go, one more thing. Um, no, seriously, in all, in all seriousness, what we are focused on doing is really that front office transformation. So you saw the wheel of context that, and, and, and information that uh, can inform predictive cloud. Well, cloud craze and the front office transformation really is this digital investment and really is almost that single point of entry for orders, right? Our goal in building this platform has been really twofold. Number one is address uh, the complexity of B2B organizations. We handle all of the complex pricing rules, uh, sophistication of subscriptions, the, the management of that complete life cycle. We provide the omni-channel experience, right? We are plugged in natively to Salesforce, so it's very easy to embed the commerce experience, that catalog, the rich content, that structure. Uh, I see strategies like one of the type of things that I, I <coughs> Absolutely, right? Yeah. So now I'm communicating with sales, I'm communicating with the customer from one channel, I'm communicating with service from one channel. Now we can inform with Predictive Cloud much more rapidly, much more easily. Um, the third area that of differentiation for us is that we're SaaS-based. Yes, you've probably already heard that or gathered that because we're native to Salesforce, uh, but it really is uh, remarkable. We're really the only company in the globe to be SaaS-based B2B commerce. And that's turning a tremendous amount of heads in the analyst community. Gartner recognized us this year as a visionary in their digital commerce MQ. Forrester, uh, last year in their B2B commerce suite, said, we're basically Salesforce on e-commerce steroids, right? Salesforce is the customer success platform. Wow, awesome. Equally awesome is just last week, we were recognized as one of the, the six SaaS vendors to watch. 
not commerce vendors, six SaaS vendors to watch in the globe. So remarkable type of activity that we've seen, and it's really driven by a lot of our customers and the success. You've heard us talk about AB InBev, Coca-Cola, uh, but we're really working with a variety of organizations across the globe uh, to transform their business. Uh, and it really is about this digital transformation, this front office transformation to make sales much more effective, right? This is not necessarily a story, this, this is not a story about displacing sales reps. While, you know, the research is titled Death of a Salesman, we're really, <laughs> we're really focused on making them much more effective and, and helping drive revenue um, much more efficiently and effectively. So, you know, please, well, I don't have um, the brain power of the predictive cloud team. Um, I do have a great set of brain power uh, behind us at Cloud Craze. So please engage with us, uh, engage with uh, the predictive cloud team um, now, this evening, um, and through uh, email and Twitter, et cetera. So I want to thank you for your time this afternoon. Um, enjoy speaking with you. And have a great, great evening. All right? Can we, should we all do free bird before we go? So it's about the only time you can be that guy, right? Legitimately, right? <laughs> free bird. It's so on like the uh, the online stuff that you guys are doing. Yes. As far as like the things you're tracking, where they're coming from. So are you essentially? Well, for one, are you guys only like available for the enterprise? Uh, no. Uh, we have a lot of uh, large enterprise customers, but we have customers that are in the mid-market okay. as well. Uh, these are the recognizable global brands, which is, uh, frankly, I've worked for other commerce vendors, large commerce vendors, and I would have died to have logos like this. I mean, they're just really enviable brands. So. The Hexagon? Oh, yeah. And and hipsters. It's, it's a test and learn. So you go build your own custom granola so you can have good jalapenos and really? lavender flowers. And they've kind of plugged into IBM Watson. So Watson yeah. makes uh, unconventional taste recommendations in terms of the ingredients. And then you can customize the actual container and deliver it free shipping wow. for $9.99. Free shipping uh, too. Huh? Yeah, and so they want to basically build up this pattern of uh, you know the different combinations that people like, so there's full feedback loops, and then they'll they, they see it as a startup because right. it, their struggle was they couldn't get any uh, any creativity out of their teams because no one had any power unless they were a billion dollar brand. So how do you get that billion dollar brand without acquiring it? So now they're actually looking at basically creating their own uh, think tank startup within right. Kellogg. AB InBev is doing the same thing, um, and so but they need a tool that allows them to start with. Their initial target is 500 orders, then they're going to do 5,000 orders, then they want to do 50,000 orders, and they'll add money as they go. So go check out the site. Uh, well, I'll take a look That's B E A R nakedcustom.com. <laughs> I mean, it's based on having data already, right? And so I guess my question is is I'm coming from a space where we obviously have a lot of data, um, mm -hmm. but we also develop products that no one's ever seen before, and we're not only developing. Mm. So we're the ones that are creating the data. So have any of your other customers, I guess, what's a good example? I mean, maybe Coke is a good example, and you come out with Coke, Coke Zero. Yeah. Um, yeah. Did, you, did they leverage the big data and the predictive analytics of Coke to predict who might also buy Coke Zero, even though it was new and creating a new market? Well, well branding yeah. sense is very important for Coke. So Coke and Pepsi are losing share in the traditional markets because of the attack on they're bringing in lots of new brands, and so what's important for them is where to introduce those brands, how broad a portfolio to introduce, um, how much to spend on that introduction, uh, and so they, similar to the Kellogg thing, they want to be able to basically do test markets, test markets, and constantly adjust. Where I think we're, what uh, what we heard from the Kellogg marketing guy was their traditional approach was you go all do it in the conference room. And then go do a hundred million dollar campaign on it, and then seventy five percent of the time it falls on its face a year and a half later. So what they're doing is they're they're you know executing quickly and they're failing quickly mm -hmm. and they're pivoting quickly. So I think that would be the answer. That's what the tool would do. Uh, or my tools would do is allow you to do that much more cost effectively. Well, I think that um, depending on the context, this goes back to having 
to integrated application is that the user responsibility is what we call a general model. And so in any cell, like if in a sales lead scoring, a lot of the predictive analysis will come from very specific data points. What was the marketing campaign name? How has it performed over time? The VP of sales. The, but then there's also like industry is always in there, so is geo. Then we got a general model that can kind of match those up. And so I think there's, like you said, you have a test campaign, gives you a ton of data, you can build something off of that. But like assuming you're not completely like, say building the first, you know, high powered electric sports car, you know, but you know, have something that you're, you're building in something like a, a channel that already exists, because usually the channel, you're using a channel that's already there, mm -hmm. which means that channel will come with a set of features or variables that everyone has. And there'll be a general model that will be like, okay, Size of the company, size of the deal, where is it located, what's the industry, those will still be pretty powerfully predictive. And again, the rest of the value is integrating that in with prescriptive actions. So even if that, even if the predictive model would need to get a lot better as you got more data, mm -hmm. having um, some algorithms and some prescriptions still makes it much more powerful than just, oh, let's launch in Cleveland. You know? Right. Well, well, well that, that is, there might be some adjacent markets or other mm -hmm. classes. Yeah. I just don't want to spend 30 yes. k on buying a big data set of, you know, in my business, general cardiologists, when yeah. perhaps I can leverage all of Medtronic, because right. we can handle a lot of big data. Yeah, 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 like our existing yeah. customers, but I'd love to, I'd, I'd wonder if we could predict if, like, one of our guys has been implanting pacemakers for 30 years and is a really big Medtronic loyal customer, can I, based on his purchase of pacemakers, could I predict how interested he might be in my new product that's not a pacemaker, but that he can awesome possibly that's Yeah. That's a great question. Awesome question. Yeah, yeah, and so, I mean, the data sling, like, and for, so when we did the uh, Coke North America, they had no digital channel at all for this target. Um, so what did they do? They looked at the customers that were complaining. They looked, actually had a list of people who had said, do not call me because they had an outbound call center. Stop calling me. I'll call you, or I'll send you a fax, right? Uh, when, when I'm order, right? So that that was about a thousand outlets, and so that's what they targeted. They said, okay, if we can come up with a solution that makes these guys happy, then we can kind of learn from that. And so now they're actually doing um, monthly releases. So they went from a thousand to five thousand to ten thousand outlets, and each one they start segmenting each one, and each one brings new requirements, and that they're in a continuous development cycle, so they can constantly keep everyone happy and evolve it. The difference between that and the old platforms is you would literally just go design in the conference room over six months, you would bid it out, you build it over 18 months, and then you never ever upgrade it again. Secret yeah. all the time. Yeah. Yeah. And with those databases that you're talking about, there's like NPI, or what is it? It's like, um, I think it's NPI fields. Mm -hmm. That tells you specifically on like that physician and what they are able to prescribe and the amount of people that have already yeah. used it. You know, I've got a couple of friends <coughs> like at UH that use it heavily for forecasts and all kinds of stuff. Yeah, it's definitely a starting point. It's almost point. like, yeah. They've got, I mean, it, it's pretty exact, like, you know, they get so, he's so analytical that by the time, <laughs> you know, he's done, I mean, they've got, like, it's pretty targeted, you know, mm -hmm. that help pays him big bucks, I think, because of how deep he has to get into it, and, like, <clears throat> you know, his forecasts are so close based on that database, because you have every prescription that was ever prescribed by that uh, doctor, you know, whoever yeah. mm -hmm. has the licensing from the DEA, or, or in your case, it's, a, it's like a DMAE product, or no? It's, um, I, I, I love where you're going with that, and then there would be the level deeper where um, we only have a certain number of insurance companies that okay. cover our products, okay. so then we'd have to go that second piece to get to that really slim. And then like with the, 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 the most recent update too, like, uh, what is it, like, a new coverage, coverage deal yeah. that kind of, kind of changed it.
terms of the coverage overall based on that new universal plan that they all had to offer. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm seeing with a lot of people, because uh, you mentioned cardiologists and specifically, um, when people are having other alternatives because of the fact that their insurance plan doesn't even you know, rich enough to cover the specific procedures or whatnot. Yeah. That database is like you saying, like how accurate. I mean, well, when you have, you know, every single like you know, it's like you're gonna have a high cholesterol pill, uh, you know, blood thinner, and like you know, something else before they get to the director of the case, make sure once they had a heart attack, right, like right off the bat, and then they get people diagnosed for stress. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that database is worth it. It's like a million bucks, <laughs> two times a year. Cool thing about this last week, you know, or last Monday. Like, uh, you know, know we just sell source of customer success guests just like make requests. requests. Yeah. 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 So I just quickly, yeah. so so no hire, no hire. You guys are both on that. You know, yeah, that's our selling. That was it. It's common. Yeah, it's very common. No, you know that. Not having a cell phone? No, no, I mean, just being able to mix from the Wi Fi. I've been setting my daughter up with a 